So this is the part one of a lecture on defining and measuring aging from August 19th, 2020. And the main focus of this lecture is going to be this learning objective here to explain why aging research didn't really emerge as a field until the early 20th century or the early 1900s. So aging research is often um, also known by another term, which is biogerontology. And biogerontology is the study of the biological mechanisms of how we age um, as well as why we age. And in terms of kind of comparing biogerontology or aging research to other scientific fields like biology as a whole or physiology or chemistry, um, aging research or biogerontology is really kind of young in the grand scheme of things. Um, the first evidence of people kind of getting together and talking about aging research was in 1937 when the Club for Aging Research was formed in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And that club would later go on to become what's now the Gerontological Society of America, um, which was formed in 1945 and just celebrated its 75 year anniversary. Um, and so you can see that physicians also thought it was kind of important to start studying aging in the 1940s and they formed the American Geriatrics Society, um, geriatrics being the field of medicine that's dedicated to um, older people. And the National Institute on Aging didn't really um, form until the 1970s. And the National Institute on Aging is part of the larger National Institutes of Health, or NIH. Um, and this institute particularly um, for aging has a large grant um, pool of about $1.2 billion, and it funds research on aging. But this field before the 1940s didn't really exist. Um, and so I want you to take a moment and sort of think about why aging research might not have been important until the early 20th century. And so take a second, pause the video, and kind of think of why that might be. And so one of the reasons you may have thought of is that um, up until the early 1900s, people were just not living long enough to warrant the necessity of aging research. And so you can see here on this graph the life expectancy of Western European and United States citizens from 1500 through 2000, I believe, <laughs> through 2000. And what you'll notice is that the life expectancy <laughs> for humans hovered somewhere around that 40 to 50 age mark for the last, for those sort of 400 years from 1500 to 1900. And then there's a sharp increase at, starting at about 1910, where the life expectancy for humans increased about 30 years from 51 in 1910 to almost 80 years old in 2017. And so one reason that aging research didn't come about until this point here in the 1940s is because people just were not living long enough to bother research aging, bother, bother, you know, researching aging. <coughs> and so what's important to remember, in addition to this change in life expectancy that happened in the early 20th century, is that there are actually differences still in life expectancy today between different races um, and ethnicities. And so here, this graph on the left, you can see between 1970 and 2015, uh, the change in life expectancy by years um, between white females and males, as well as black females and males. And you can see that even though all of the groups have increased their life expectancy in the past 45 years, um, there is still some differences between both genders, right? So white females versus white males, black females versus black males, um, as well as race. And so <laughs> we look at white and black females, there are still some differences um, in the life expectancy that can be based on race. And over here on the right, you can see um, just the average life expectancy for different races, uh, racial and ethnic groups um, by years. And so they're organized from lowest life expectancy on the left to highest 
And so African Americans have the lowest life expectancy still in the United States. Um, white um, people have some a life expectancy in the middle, and then Latinx and Asian Americans have higher life expectancies, um, almost 87 years for Asian Americans. And so this diversity in life expectancy is something to keep in mind as well. And one of the reasons <coughs> for this sort of change or shift um, in life expectancy was that the leading causes of death in the United States in 1900 are much different than they are um, later in the 20th century and now into the 21st. And so early in the 20th century, you can see some of the leading causes of death listed here. Influenza and pneumonia, as well as tuberculosis and diarrheal diseases, make up almost 30% of all deaths, um, which is a lot. Um, and most of these diseases are caused by either bacteria or viruses that we now have antibiotics to fight against. And so that advent of antibiotics and that sort of push in um, medical knowledge and understanding helped eliminate some of the diseases as major causes of death and extend life expectancy as a result. And so now we have some diseases that we used to not see, right? Like Alzheimer's disease, which <clears throat> is correlated heavily with age. Um, we also see heart disease and cancer, both of which are highly correlated with older age. Um, being some of the main causes of death because we have pushed medical technology past the point of dying from a bacterial disease or a diarrheal bacterial disease or tuberculosis. And now <coughs> um, we are dying of these sort of more complicated and age-related disorders. One other sort of medical advance that helped push the life expectancy of women forward was actually the fact that they were still dying very heavily of childbirth in the early 20th century, um, and that is something that's declined with advances in medical technology as well. And so there was no real point in study, studying aging up until the 1940s, 50s, because people just were not getting old enough. But then once they started to age more, um, it became apparent that there was some necessity in studying kind of like how and why um, people are but what's interesting when you think about aging research is that most of the time in biomedical field, the goal of the research is to find a cure for the disease. Um, but in terms of aging, there's no cure that can be found for either aging or for death. And so the research that most people do on aging today is not necessarily focused on extending life expectancy or lifespan or how long that you live, but actually improving quality of life or what's known as health span. And so health span is slightly different from lifespan um, because health span indicates sort of that time of your life that's spent in relatively good health and where you're free from chronic diseases or other disabilities or disadvantages that come with aging. And so kind of simply health span is how well a person lives um, or as lifespan is how long a person lives. And so right now, Aging research focuses heavily on improving quality of life and how well a person lives. Um, and that includes funding research um, on economics so that you can understand how um, economic issues can impact health span in older adults. It also involves um, psychology and sociology research. So studying the mental health of people as they age and helping them kind of come to terms with that is part of this holistic approach to aging research. So we study the biology of aging, but we also study all of these other things um, to come up with some kind of holistic um, and helpful information to improve people's quality of life. And rather than study humans always in terms of aging, we also use a lot of um, what are known as genetic model organisms to conduct aging research. And so yeast is one of the most common um, places to start when looking for genetic contributors to aging. Um, we use the model organism Saccharomyces cerevisiae or baker's yeast, the same yeast you use to bake bread um, to work out some of those pathways. I mean, also there's been a ton of aging research done on um, Saccharomyces elegans or C. elegans, which is this worm up here. Um, that is what I work on and that is what we're going to be using in the lab 
there's a lot of great things about C. elegans, but when it comes to aging research, the most kind of important one is how quickly they, one, develop to adulthood and two, age after that. So they have a relatively short lifespan. They live on average for about 20 days, um, and it only takes them three days to go from an embryo to adulthood. And so you can do an aging experiment um, in the course of a month and look at modifiers of aging, lifespan, as well as health span, or how well those worms are living. And correlations are actually pretty strong between a lot of the pathways involved in aging in C. elegans and the pathways involved in aging in humans. And so we've made a lot of progress using them, and that is why I'm really excited about this lab that we're gonna do, um, where you guys are actually going to be looking at some known um, modifiers of lifespan, some compounds like caffeine and turmeric that have been shown time and time again to extend lifespan. And what you're going to do is focus more on the health span aspect and use some different um, measures of health span in the worms, such as how well they move or how well their memory works, um, to determine if those compounds that extend lifespan are actually improving the quality of life for the worms as well.